2002, someone launched a bombing campaign across the United States, planting bombs in the shape of a multi-state smiley face and leaving several victims in their wake. It sounds like something the Joker might do in a Batman movie, if the writers at DC ever remember to put anything even remotely interesting in their films, but who was the smiley face bomber and why were they doing this? The first bombs were planted in mailboxes. They were pipe bombs, which are relatively easy for the average person to construct. Here's a quick how-to guide. Now that we know how pipe bombs are made, it's important to note that these bombs were a little more complex, as they were rigged to detonate once the mailboxes were opened, catching unsuspecting homeowners and mail carriers alike in the blast. The first bomb detonated in Dubuque, Iowa on May 3rd, 2002, injuring a mailman opening the mailbox. The same day, four more bombs were detonated in Iowa. In Farley, the bomb was detected and detonated by law enforcement. In Anamosa, a bomb injured another person, and in Tipton, another. Law enforcement managed to safely detonate another in Eldridge. But there were more bombs detonated before the day was even over, these ones in Illinois. Each bomb in Morrison, Mount Carroll and Elizabeth injured people opening their mailboxes. By the end of the day, eight bombs had exploded and six people had been injured. Injuries ranged from mangled hands to shrapnel lodgments to hearing loss. Some were permanently disfigured. It didn't appear the victims had been specifically targeted, rather the bombs were placed indiscriminately and the bomber didn't care who got hurt. Some of the bombs were accompanied by letters that were critical of the government. They opined that people's freedoms were becoming more and more restricted, that society was degenerating and that the planet was dying. They were similar in sentiment to the Unabomber's manifesto, but it couldn't have been him as he'd been incarcerated for years at this point. Officials advised people to leave their mailboxes open but the bomber's approach was about to change. The next day on May 4th, six more bombs were detonated in Nebraska. This time bombs were found in bags, rigged to detonate when the bag was opened. Bombs in Seward, Ohio, Davenport, Dannebrog, Scotia and Columbus were all detonated by law enforcement. The following day, another was discovered and safely detonated in Albion. The same thing happened the day after that on May 6th, this time in Hastings. Before the day was out, two more bombs were detonated in a similar manner, although they were oddly nowhere near the original clusters. One was found in Salida, Colorado and another in Amarillo, Texas. Strangely, the pipe bomb in Texas did not have the 9 volt battery needed to detonate it, and the accompanying letter stated the bomber did not wish to kill. By now, the media was referring to them as the Midwest Pipe Bomber, due to the majority of the 18 bombs being found in the Midwest. If you're a fellow non-American and wondering why this region is called the Midwest and not the Mid-North, it's just because Americans are terrible with directions. They also drive on the right-hand side of the road because it's the right side rather than the wrong side. The FBI finally had a tip as to the identity of the Midwest pipe bomber. A student at the University of Wisconsin Stout alerted authorities when he found black powder and pieces of pipe in the apartment he shared with his roommate, 21-year-old Luke Helder. Investigators further noted that Helder had not been seen on campus for a week. On May 7th, police caught up with Helder, who was driving a black Honda Accord. When Helder noticed he was being followed, a chase ensued, leading to Nevada. Helder had a shotgun in the car with him. FBI negotiators got on the phone with Helder, who was threatening to shoot himself, but the negotiators talked him out of it. Helder threw the gun out of the window and surrendered peacefully. Six pipe bombs were found in his car. He told arresting officers that he was trying to make a smiley face with the bombs. He had covered 3,200 miles before being caught partway through the mouth's completion. As to why Luke Helder was doing this, investigators found little more than a disgruntled attitude towards the state of the world. His room was covered in posters of grunge band Nirvana and its late frontman Kurt Cobain. Apparently, he'd been arrested wearing a Kurt Cobain t-shirt. Helder actually had his own three-piece grunge band called 
Apathy, a laughably uninspired name for a grunge band. Even Homer Simpson had a more creative name for his grunge band, and that was literal parody. Apathy was also what the general public felt towards the album the band had recorded and released themselves. Some stores had to literally give it away. That was until Luke Helder's identity as the Midwestern pipe bomber was revealed. Then people scrambled to pick it up. Hand in hand with his love of grunge was Helder's apparent nihilism. Those who knew him said he had become obsessed with death and would recite extended monologues detailing his beliefs that there was an existence beyond death. Yeah, you're a few thousand years late to the party with that idea, mate. Think Jesus was saying something similar around about the time the Roman Empire occupied Judea. Only Jesus didn't go around trying to kill people. You know why? Well, because he had his dad to do it for him. But it's not right. Luke Helder was charged with using an explosive to maliciously destroy property affecting interstate commerce and with using a destructive device to commit a crime of violence. He appeared to be in a jovial and unserious mood in court. In 2004, a federal judge found Helder incompetent to stand trial and he was incarcerated in the Federal Medical Center in Rochester, Minnesota, where he was later diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. Helder, now 42, has remained there ever since, although he could still face trial if he is ever found competent to stand it. And that ends the story. Well, except for the fact that the Midwest isn't called that because Americans are bad with directions. It comes from the times when the United States territory was entirely situated in the East, and every other part of the country was the West. Parts of what are now known as the Midwest were called the Northwest because that's as far as US territory went. Then the US expanded further. So what do you call the Old West when there's all this new West even Westerner than it? Well, they started calling it the Middle West or Midwest. So it's a historical hangover rather than a geographical blunder. Well, if you liked this video and maybe even learned something from it, then you need to understand I have bettered you as a person and now I want something in return. Well, not really. Do what you want, I don't care. But if you'd like to, you can watch more of my videos and even subscribe to see a new one every week. Why not follow me on Twitter too? Thank you and stay safe.